All right. We we'll have our residents today. We'll start by um, doing a little more practice with with uh, skeletal structure and counting atoms. And bonds. Count to four, not five. If I beat that joke to death, it'll stick in your head. Really, I think we did we did a sal um, sal we'll do acid. Yeah, the first two we didn't do caffeine. Okay. But we did not discuss lone pairs. So it's still worth practicing drawing your lone pairs. So any neutral carbon is going to have no lone pairs, right? Um, any neutral nitrogen will have one lone pair. Any neutral oxygen will have two lone pairs. Um, they don't really affect bonding so much, but you but halogens as well when you have a chlorine, a chlorine attached to something with one bond, typically that's three lone pairs. And it turns out lone pairs do play a significant role in resonance, which we're talking about today. So it's worth reminding ourselves where to find them. So for caffeine, where are all the hydrogens? Just yeah, just yeah, just seems like um, one cellular carbons, yeah. That's the easiest way to do the answer to that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So on these these methyl groups, which you know we haven't defined methyl as a prefix yet, but there's all the carbons and hydrogens. All of our nitrogens and oxygens are going to be where we find the lone pairs here. <clears throat> So two lone pairs on an oxygen. You can see with these complicated structures why I default to drawing the little loop around the lone pairs. It'd be really easy to lose a pair of lone pairs or a pair of electrons if you weren't if you weren't doing that. It makes it look more crowded, but it makes sure you don't lose things as much once you know what you're looking for. It's easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Molecular formula wind up being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. There are four nitrogens, two oxygens, and three, six, nine, and ten. Right, so there's nothing nothing real tricky about doing these molecular formulas if you draw everything out. Trying to do all that in your head to keep yeah. track of everything, you usually wind up using tick marks or, or tally, tally marks or something to keep track of it anyway. Uh, at which point you might as well just draw stuff in. All right, um, a couple notes about showing 3D structure. We have been, it's, we're going to use the same notation that we used um, back in Gen Chem, where we use wedges and dashes to indicate 3D structure. So dashes means going into the board, wedges coming out of the board, 
That also means we get some complicated in, in organic chemistry. There's so many ways we can arrange carbon atoms that we wind up with some that are kind of tricky to draw, even if we have that. But for instance, a bicyclic structure. So this is a, a six sided ring where the two opposite corners are actually connected by another carbon. So it's a five sided ring and a six sided ring fused together. Because if you can picture, There's a pentagon, right? There's a five-sided ring. But then you simultaneously have a six-sided ring. That's why they call that a bicyclic structure. It's two, two cycles fused together. Um, we typically use bicyclic for when they're sharing more than one side. Typically, something like, say, naphthalene is a two-fused ring structures. But when they're only sharing one side, so we wouldn't call that bicyclic typically. Um, but that, that also may change from, from teacher to teacher. Um, I typically reserve the word bicyclic to mean something like that. Um, there are lots of other ways to show um, to show 3D structure in a two-dimensional surface. Uh, they do wind up, these two in particular, wind up showing up more in biochem than they do in organic chem chemistry, typically. Um, we'll look at some things that look kind of like this as a way to visualize ring structure in 3D. We'll, we'll draw a ring structure flat, and then we'll say, okay, now we're going to take it and tip it on its side. So it looks kind of like that so we can visualize what's going on. Um, but the thing is, is it doesn't really capture the true 3D structure even that well, because even this, these two carbons, or this oxygen and that hydrogen are not really per, per, uh, 180 degrees from each other, right? This carbon is still tetrahedral, so they're both you know, more like they're pointed out towards us. So you still have to use your imagine and understand how tetrahedral structures work, um, but they can be useful for some in some cases, um, Fischer projection in particular gets used for carbohydrates, for small sugars. When they're in that, oh, I know we talked about that last on uh, Tuesday about how carbohydrates have a ring structure versus an open structure. For uh, when they're in their open structure, this can be helpful as a way to show 3D structure because they basically say, okay, we're going to treat it like every bond that's vertical is dashed, is going into the board. And every bond that's horizontal is coming out towards you. So you really, this carbon here would look like <clears throat> would look like that. Which also, the, another way to draw any tetrahedral carbon. So by convention, we typically draw them something like this where you do two, two bonds in the plane of the board, one sticking out, one sticking in. That's a convenient, easy way to draw a tetrahedral structure. But if you picture taking this structure and turning it so that these two hydrogens that are flat are now pointed towards you, the other two would then be pointed away from you. Basically, if you took this and you looked at it from this angle, from in the plane of the board, you would get something that looks like that, right? That's really what this is showing. It's showing two, two of your bonds towards you, two of your bonds away. The other way you can visualize what those angles look like is if you if you stretch your, your thumb and your forefinger, that's a close, you can get it close to 120 degrees, so more like 90. Depending on if you play instruments, that might change. I know in particular, guitar players, their fretting hand typically has much bigger range than their than their not dominant hand does, um, just from stretching and practice. Uh, but if you can picture taking these your thumb and your forefinger and doing this, your thumbs and your forefingers then are pointed in about the directions that you would get of a tetrahedral shape. 
And so it's basically like looking down one of those angles. So for the Fisher projection, you said that horizontal is coming out at you, vertical is going into the board. I always mix it up. I don't either way. It's it's one way or the other. Yeah, either way, um, you still get a tetrahedral. The sure. diagonal ones and uh, the bottom molecule, the rest of the molecule. This one. Yeah, that little piece and then the. So that's going to be a trigonal planar geometry. Okay. So it'll fall out of the. So Fisher basically, region. it's yeah. So you don't necessarily it doesn't follow those same rules yeah. because it's not tetrahedral. Um, and this one winds up. It's this one is still tetrahedral. But and we haven't started talking about um, stereochemistry yet when we do. Uh, and if you remember talking about mirror images um, from Gen Chem, if it doesn't have a superimposable mirror image, then it doesn't actually matter which hydrogen you draw in which direction. So they're not showing specifically the 3D structure for this bottom one because it's not a stereo center. It's not an asymmetric carbon, so we don't need to worry about it. The geometry there. But, and again, we're not going to use Fisher projection in this class. It's something to be aware of because when you take biochem classes, it will show up. And, and doing something like switching this oxygen with that hydrogen will change whether or not it's glucose. This is glucose swap, swip it, switching those two, swapping those two, um, winds up giving you a totally different molecule that your body doesn't process the same way. Um, so it winds up being more important in biochemistry. Um, and then this one is basically, so it's this, close to the same molecule, same general bicyclic structure. You take this one where you can picture, where you can picture, okay, I've got a hexagon, a flat hexagon, and then the two ends are connected by one carbon in between. If you take that and you turn it, Flat rock. That's what this is. And you can still see there's still a hexagon there. And then the pentagon you can see there are those carbons. Would it be the pentagon on the other side? Yes, I just picked the side that doesn't yeah. have other stuff on it gotcha. for clarity. All right, so, it, and they call it, with that in mind, it is actually tricyclic, right? but they call it a bicyclic structure to when it's symmetrical like that. It's too different. <laughs> exactly. And they can't actually be two of the same ones. You can have, uh, I messed up. You can have yeah. two hexagons fused together if it's two carbons bridging the two points. So then if you if you look at this side and that side, that would be three hexagons kind of all fused together. It's but it's only eight carbons, but you managed to make three hexagons out of eight carbons. Turns out you can't do that without getting creative in three dimensions. Right. <laughs> and if the if the if the map and the geometry of that is interesting to you, um, upper division math classes like topology um, start where they start looking at things like okay, how many? What's the minimum number of points that you need to make this many shared bases and things like that? Um, and they go past three dimensions, and that's where they lose me. Um, I like to think I'm pretty good at, at understanding intellectually what happens past three dimensions, but the, the topologists and math departments just totally, they talk about the Klein bottles and um, four-dimensional cubes. You know, that's actually with the, what a tesseract is. Tesseract, like from, from the Marvel movies, a tesseract is the four-dimensional equivalent of a cube. So just like a cube is the three-dimensional equivalent of a square, a tesseract is a four-dimensional equivalent of a cube. And any, any direction that you slice it, except it's not sliced like taking two dimensions, 
it's slice in three dimensions. You can take a three dimensional slice, slice of a four dimensional object and it's a cube. Right. Which, so stuff like that, if that's interesting, you take more upper division math because that stuff is wild and I don't understand it. I don't even have a way to visualize that. But Six cubes would be a test track, right? Eight, I believe. I'm not sure. Okay, let's not put it <laughs> ask me, ask me, great, and we'll look it up and see if I'm right. I, for whatever reason, I want to say it's eight, maybe because that's two to the third power. I was just thinking from two dimensions to three, you put six two dimensions to put together three dimensional. So okay. it might be something like 12 because four dimensions works really weird. Right. Um, <laughs> there is a part there. All right. We are going to skip this one because we just did Kathy and counted all of the hydrogens and lone pairs. Um, and we're going to throw our original idea of hybridization out the window anyway, because we're going to start doing resonance today and delocalized electrons. All right, so when we're talking about these molecular orbitals, we are making that born oppenheimer approximation we talked about back in the first day of class, where we're assuming that the electrons are what are actually moving. The nuclei are so much heavier than the electrons that it, that it, assuming that the electrons and the nuclei are the same temperature, which seems like a valid assumption to make, then we can basically treat the nuclei like they're standing still. If the nuclei are standing still, only things that are actually moving that we care about are the electrons. And since the electrons are what make up all the bonds anyway, um, we wind up talking way more about electrons um, in terms of the nuclei are important for making the, the structures, and figuring out what's a stable structure or not. But as far as any reactions that are happening, that's always electrons moving. Um, and so sometimes you can have these, if you can get orbitals to overlap, even molecular bonding orbitals like sigma bonds or pi bonds, you can actually get electrons to transfer from one mod to another bond or from one orbital to another orbital. And that's actually what a chemical reaction is, at least in okay. Organic reaction is always going to be moving electrons from one orbital to another orbital. Right. And I don't know if Carl used the same same classification when it came to classifying reactions, but basically the way that I always divvy up chemical reactions is you can have um, what I call complexation reactions where nothing changes charge. No atoms change formal charge. All that happens is you just re rearrange your Legos, so to speak. Um, redox reactions are always going to involve electrons moving around. Most organic reactions, whether they're redox reactions or not, are still going to involve electrons changing orbitals. And really all the chemical reactions, this is just organic chemistry. So we focus on that first here. And so here's an example of an organic reaction that can happen. You have a pi bond between two carbons, and you have an alcohol group attached to that alkene. Um, this this is actually a sort of a, uh, a compound functional group. You think about compound like compound word. Compound word is just two words put together. This is a compound functional group. It's an alcohol and an alkene put together that we call an enol. So they even portmanteau the words together. Um, this enol will, will usually rearrange itself because you have these pi bonds next to an oxygen, the oxygen's really electronegative, it'll basically drag some electron density over. And that leaves an extra, extra room over here. And these electrons move over to the other carbon and you wind up making, um, basically shifting a pi bond and shifting a sigma bond. This is doesn't matter. You, you don't need to memorize that or anything right now. We'll talk about enols and, and ketones in great detail when we get there. Um, but just the idea that it's just a pi bond and a sigma bond can overlap, or a pi bond and lone pairs can overlap 
in a way that allows for electron transfer. That's going to be really key when we start talking about this. All right, so let's do a case study. We're going to do more, more historical chemistry. Um, this is, I believe this was August Cooley's great contribution. Um, so back in the mid 1800s, they knew a, a couple of things about benzene. They knew that the molecular formula was C6H6. They knew it was unusually stable. It was really hard to break it apart or to burn it. It did not burn well. When it did burn, um, you didn't get complete combustion. You got really black sooty stuff. Um, so I think, think uh, burning styrofoam. Burning styrofoam does not burn very well, right? Because it has a lot of benzene rings in it. It's primarily benzene rings. Um, when you replace one of the hydrogens with a chlorine, for example, you only get one product. That was basically all they knew when they started trying to put pieces together to, okay, well, what does benzene look like? Now we have some enough experience, we've already been using benzene rings in our examples. Um, but from that, they came up with a couple ideas. And this is one of the other key ones. If you do two substitutions, you got three products, which was a little bit weird because their initial proposed structure did look kind of like the benzene we're used to seeing. That's a hydrogen that's a there. It just doesn't like when I draw right on the corners. If you take one of these away and put, say, a chlorine there, you get one product. That's easy enough to understand. If you do that twice, if you put two substitutions, it should, if, if all those pi bonds are staying where they are, that should be five possible products of making if you do that, because you could have your two chlorines directly adjacent to each other across a pi bond or directly adjacent across a sigma bond. That should be two different products, right? Or over here, pi bond, then sigma, then chlorine, versus sigma, then pi, then chlorine. That should be two different products as well. And then lastly, directly opposite. So if this was actually the case, we would expect this, that two substitutions gives us five products. That's not what they actually observed though. They could observe by doing melting points and testing other properties. They could say, okay, well, we know we only get three different products when we do two substitutions. So Kakuli was the one who, who said, okay, well, you don't really have sigma bond, pi bond, sigma bond, pi bond, sigma bond, pi bond. You really have them going through what he called a, a rapid equilibrium, where these pi bonds can move from side, to, from side to side. Basically, they chase each other around in a circle. And even that was that was enough to explain the two the five versus the three products because if this is happening here rapid equilibrium really then that carbon and that carbon are identical because if there's our first substitution something there or there should give us the same product because it's rapidly cycling between these two. And that's the one that Cooley first described by saying it came to him in a dream and it later came out that it that it was actually, he'd been reading about Egyptian mythology and the, the snake um, that eats its own tail, the Ouroboros. 
which is a fascinating bit of mythology because it actually shows up in pretty much every culture has some form of the snake that eats its own tail as a symbol for infinity. Um, and that's actually where the Greek version of that tale is where we get our symbol for infinity. Um, it makes sense why that would be kind of widespread, right? Every culture has some understanding of what a circle is and that you can't pick a beginning and end of a circle, it kind of goes forever. Um, but for whatever reason, Kukule was reading Egyptian mythology and he came up with this, well, these electrons are chasing each other around like the Ouroboros trying to eat its own tail. But there must be something else going on because it also, they also found out that, that benzene couldn't go through the same reactions that the alkenes do. So there had to be something more going on. And that's when they started coming up with the idea of what they call electronic resonance. Electronic resonance is what we're seeing when we have these rapid equilibriums. And it turns out that there's another piece to it. It turns out that the more you can distribute these electrons, the more you can delocalize these electrons, the more stable they are. All right, so let's let's try and connect this to resonance or to um, hybridization. So for this molecule right here, what is the hybridization of all the various atoms here? So if it's got a positive charge, it only has three bonds. And the positive charge means an empty orbital. So basically, you only get three bonds and one unhybridized orbital that looks like a P orbital. And it is a P orbital, basically. Because you're only making three bonds and you don't have full valence, it doesn't take on tetrahedral shape. These carbocations have an empty p orbital. It's missing a pair of electrons. That's what gives it its positive charge. So that means that a positive, a carbon with a positive charge will also be sp2 because it's got three. If you think about it from the from the perspective of molecular geometry. It only has three groups of electrons taking up space, right? Yeah. Which would make it trigonal planar. The last empty space that you could put electrons in <laughs> is an unhybridized p orbital. Why would you hybridize the p orbital if, if you're not going to put electrons in it? It doesn't need to take up space. And trigonal planar allows these electrons to spread out more. Now, it's not terribly stable. Because if we don't have, we have an incomplete valence on that carbon. Well, so if we have sp two and sp two, these these are going to have these unhybridized p orbitals overlapping to make a pi bond, right? We also have an unhybridized p orbital over here. It's not part of a pi bond, but it's oriented the same way as that pi bond. So basically, we have space that's not being used. It's already in the same shape as a pi bond. So it turns out what we actually wind up seeing is that those pi electrons spread out into all three orbitals you wind up being able to spread them out and make them or get one big pi bond, basically. And you spread those pi electrons over the entire system. And so here's the same, all three of these all being sp2 means they're all trigonal planar. They all have an unhybridized p orbital which means you can mix them all together to make one big pi bond. That's what resonance is. 
Residence is basically if you have space for a lone pair or a pi bond to spread out more, it'll do so because it's more stable. The larger the box you can put these electrons in, the more stable they are. <clears throat> And we, we can actually calculate that. If we take all of these orbitals and mix them together to find the lowest energy state, we get something that looks like it's it's a bonding orbital, but it looks like a, I don't want to call it a double pi bond because it's not two pi bonds between the same carbons. It's just a smeared out pi bond, basically. And so if you have more than one way to, to distribute those electrons that are, just, that are equally stable, a lot of times we'll represent them by drawing both possibilities. So going from the example we just had before, here's the way it was drawn, right? But if we had an unhybridized P orbitals all the way across, we could just as easily have drawn it like this without moving any nuclei, right? Or breaking it. Any sigma bonds? We have the same number of hybrid, excuse me, of um, unhybridized orbitals, and we have the same number of atoms that are missing a, a pair of electrons, right? So, looking at formal charge, we have the same formal charge on both of these. To put it in that perspective, so it's a little bit like. You remember drawing the Lewis dot structures for nitrate. Nitrate looked like this. How do we know where to put the double bonds? All those oxygens are identical, right? So we just sort of picked one. Same here. We, we had to give a positive charge to one of our carbons. It didn't really matter which one. We could draw the positive charge as being on either side and have the molecule be just as stable. We didn't move any nuclei. We didn't break any, any sigma bonds. So these are both equally valid structures. They're both equally stable. If they're equally stable and all we had to do was move a pair of electrons back and forth to do so, then we don't really get either one of them, we get both of them. And that's the same thing you see with a lot of our polyatomic ions. How do I know where, where to draw the, the pi bonds between nitrogen and oxygen? I don't, I picked an oxygen. I could have just as easily picked that oxygen or that oxygen, right? And really, it will wind up being about a third of a pi bond between each of them. You wind up with the same thing happening here where it's smeared out over the entire molecule. Right. It's hard to draw that very well, though. So sometimes people will try, and you'll, you'll see them draw a structure that looks like this, and then put a charge on the entire thing to make it look like it's really the average of these two. You can see how that would kind of represent something looking like this, right? And even with benzene, sometimes you see people do that with benzene. So they just like, draw put a circle. circle. <laughs> or just draw a circle, right? That's probably more common with benzene because it's even faster. Once you know what that's supposed to represent, that's a lot easier to draw than drawing out and, and making sure you're counting and, and double, bond. double bonds and for all of them. And it actually does represent what benzene is actually doing better. So it's actually a more accurate picture and gets faster. Um, so that's a really handy way of, of representing benzene for that reason. I like this diagram <laughs> for a number of reasons. If you take a unicorn and a dragon and you average them out, unicorn doesn't exist, the dragon doesn't exist. But if you take them and you average them together, you get something that does exist. So this structure doesn't exist and that structure doesn't exist. 
But if you average them together, that structure does. That's basically what resonance structures are. Is it's the pieces that you average together to get what the electrons are actually doing when they're delocalized. What does the MO stand for? Uh, molecular orbital. So that's the, the orbitals when they're all averaged together, when they're added up to get all that constructive interference. As compared to like um, transition metals, like how do they share electrons? Because D orbitals get a little bit weird, especially when you start, when you, if you're keeping them as individual atoms, you can't really have resonance structures when it's just one atom. One atom can't really have a resonance structure. Um, but they do something different when you take metals and you put them into a, into a surface, into a big bulk, a solid. Um, it's almost the opposite. Here, we're, we have, we're missing electrons, right? And so they spread the electrons out to make everything more stable so that everything can kind of pretend like it has, it has a full valence. Transition metals and metals in general are trying to get rid of the electrons. And so they make similar bonding orbitals, but it's basically like nobody wants the electrons. And so they put them all into the community space. Um, it'd be, otherwise it would be like if you had a, a, an apartment with three bedrooms and, and two roommates and um, nobody wanted to keep the trash in their bedroom, right? It'd be a normal thing. You put the trash in the community space because nobody really wants it next to their bed, right? Metals kind of behave more like that. I was thinking more three people in a three bedroom, but everybody's staying in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's, it does, there's a lot of good analogies you can come up with, but metals are kind of the opposite of the non-metals for more than one reason. But predominantly it's because metals are trying to push the electrons away to become more stable and non-metals need to gain electrons to become more stable. So they behave in similar but opposite ways. Based on the same laws, right? Based on the same laws. They still have the same rules. They're just starting from different places. Okay. And so here's an example of what the bonding orbitals of benzene look like. So it turns out you don't actually have Pretty good to best. So Kukuli's idea that it was rapidly cycling between these two was a good way to start thinking about it. And you can kind of think about it the same way that if you um, if you spin a uh, propeller on an airplane. Initially, you can see where all three pieces are, right? It's a three-sided propeller. But then pretty quickly, your brain can't keep up with it. Your eyes can't keep up with it. And it just turns into like a blur where all three propellers are somewhere in this circle. But you can't really point to any one place and say the propeller is there. It's, the propeller is in all the, that spot simultaneously. Um, and even that is an analogy of balls apart because it's not really cycling back and forth between these. It is both of them simultaneously, right? Just like we would say a rhino is cycling back and forth between a unicorn and a dragon, and you just see the average of them. You, it's really its own thing that's you can think of as being a mixture of two things, but even that's an approximation. The orbitals look like this, not like that or like that or even back and forth. Um, and so this is actually, we talked about this in lab when we were talking about how the, the crystal structures build in one direction preferentially for aromatic compounds. The, this is what I was referring to as a pi cloud. On above and below the benzene ring, you wind up with this sort of like cushion of p orbitals that are all sort of stacked together. And so, if you, you naturally get a 
favorable interaction if you stack these pile electrons on top of each other instead of stacking one like this or stacking them next to each other they would rather have the pile electrons on touching more or less there's a slight magnetic pull towards getting them on top of each other um, which is why they grow in those nice neat shapes Uh, and here's the key. I key. I've said this a few times, but just reiterating: delocalized electrons in general are more stable than localized electrons. When we're talking about pi bonds, when we're talking about lone pairs, this doesn't apply to sigma bonds. Sigma bonds are so stable that sigma bonds won't move around like this. Plus, sigma bonds have to stay localized because you have that such good overlap right directly in between the two carbons in this case, right? If you tried to take one of those orbitals and get it to, to be delocalized, you'd be giving up a really stable bond to do that. So resonance structures will never involve breaking sigma bonds. If we have a structure, if you're breaking a sigma bond, that's a chemical reaction. That's no longer a resonance structure, right? And I'll um, also make a big deal about the type of arrows that we're going to use. In organic chemistry, type, the way you draw the arrows is really important. A double-sided arrow like this means it's a resonance structure. That's an equilibrium reaction. They look similar, or in sometimes you even see them more confusingly drawn like this. Two arrows, one forward and one backward, is equilibrium. One arrow that's double-sided is resonance. And then to further <laughs> complicate things, if we're trying to show where electrons are moving, we use curved arrows. If I wanted to show that these electrons were just shifting one spot over to get back to get to this set side, I would use curved arrows. Curved arrows means you're showing where the electrons move. Straight arrows are reaction arrows, and double sided straight arrows is a resonance structure. Two arrows is the equilibrium reaction. We get to free radical reactions, it gets even more complicated than that because then the number of bars on an arrow changes things. For instance, when you shine light on hydrogen peroxide, you get hydrogen peroxide radicals because basically uh, visible in UV light has enough energy that you can split this bond. You promote an electron into the antibonding orbital and it splits up and each of the oxygen keeps one electron, we draw that mechanism like this curved arrow, a single bar on each side shows one electron is going one way, one electron is going the other way. So chemists are nothing if not efficient with their language and their diagrams. We're trying to convey a ton of information as succinctly as possible, which means we have to be really picky about semantics. Um, this one's not going to matter yet. We're not, we're barely even talking about mechanisms for today. Um, so for the most part, what I want you to be focused on right now is the difference between this and this. And we'll add those other ones as we go. As far as the benzene ring, bringing mm -hmm. two propyl groups together, I guess you could say to create the benzene ring, but that shift electrons around to create the most stable. So would it be possible for the... When we get to, I think this is the end of the second quarter, we yeah. talk about electrocyclic reactions. And one of the examples of which is butadiene plus, I don't know why I feel like that, um, be consistent here. So if we have a two carbon, pi bond like this, and four carbons that have alternating pi bonds, they can actually, what you wind up ha happening is pi electrons move towards that carbon, these pi electrons move over, 
these pi electrons move towards that carbon. And the net result is color coding here. We make a six sided ring from six separate, two separate molecules. And that works by moving the electrons around in the pi orbitals and turning pi electrons into new sigma bonds because sigma bonds are more stable than pi bonds. So you know, in this case, all three of the bonds that's, that move are all pi electrons. Two of the pairs of pi electrons make new sigma bonds, and one of the pairs of pi electrons stays as a pi bond. But so yeah, so moving these pi electrons around does make a difference. And you wind up with interesting things happening when we start looking at these reactions. Did that answer the question that you were asking? Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it kind of complicated the question, but we'll get there, you said it in the course yeah. too, so. <laughs> All right. So here's the rules for resonance structures. Then the second half of class is going to be practice drawing them and figuring out which ones are most important. AKA, you might say, which one's most important? Does a rhino look more like a dragon or more like a unicorn? Depending on, on that's, that was a subjective one, but basically <laughs> the average of all of these isn't necessarily going to be 50-50. Sometimes it's 70-30. So that's what I was sort of getting at. With okay. That whole single structure coming together. If it's, you know, as it's coming together, it wouldn't be 100% empty ring. It would be. It would be, yeah, it would not. There's going to be a transition state yeah. that looks like you, you can start to see the benzene ring forming, but it's not going to look exactly like a benzene ring and it's not going to look like two propyl groups either. It's going to look like some kind of hybrid between the two because you're in the process of moving electrons from one orbital to another orbital. And when you're halfway in between two orbitals, it looks like both of them average together. All right, so when we're drawing resonance structures, one of the one of the quiz questions this weekend is draw all the possible resonance structures. And that's what we're going to practice a whole bunch of after a break. We're only moving electrons. You never break a sigma bond. Those are the two biggest ones. So nuclei aren't moving. There's that Born Oppenheimer approximation. Never break a sigma bond because the sigma bonds are too stable. If you're breaking a sigma bond, you've actually got a chemical reaction happening, not just a resonance structure. The net charge on the molecule will not change if you do it right. So you think about the first example we started with. There's a net plus one on the molecule before and a net plus one on the molecule after. That's what I mean by the overall charge doesn't change. The charge on an individual atom can change as you move these electrons around. Electrons cannot move towards atoms that already have a complete octet. Four, not five. Exactly. If it's already got a complete octet, you can. In one of the one of the four pairs of electrons is a lone pair. You can move electrons from something that has a complete octet towards something else. But those electrons can't. You can't push electrons towards. An atom that's already complete um, in terms of its valence. It just doesn't have room. So let's look at acetate. Let's start with the complete structure of acetate. Our acetate was CH3. Looked like this, right? So the oxygen atom has three lone pairs, right? Correct. And when, when we started um, with this, it can be helpful 
to draw all of those. This oxygen has two lone pairs. If you have a negative charge sitting here, you have an oxygen that has extra electrons. So anything with a negative charge is likely to push the electrons away from it when it comes to making these resonance structures. So this oxygen could share one of these lone pairs and then it would be neutral, it'd be stable, right? But we can't do that. There's, it doesn't have any pi bonds, but it does have lone pairs and lone pairs can participate here. That's not breaking carbon's, a sigma bond. The carbon's already full. The carbon's already full. So what do we have to do? We can shift two pairs of electrons. One, one because this oxygen has a negative charge and it would like to share more. And but then we have to make room for it. If you have, if you're moving a negative charge towards something that already has a full a full octet, you have to make room for it. You can only do that if one of the the bonds here is a pi bond. If this carbon was sp3, we can't do this because we can't break sigma bonds to make room for a resonance structure. So that means our... So we couldn't take a pi bond and shift it towards the other carbon because that would just cause more... Carbon. Bingo. We can't take a pi bond and push it over here. No matter how many electrons we but want to move. Would still, the carbon on the right-hand side would still be full, and then the left-hand side would also be full. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So basically, an sp3 carbon, there's nothing you can do with it when it comes to resonance. Yeah. sp3 nitrogens and oxygens, this is oxygen looks like it should be sp3 because it's got a full valence and no pi bonds, right? But it can delocalize one of those lone pairs in order to spread it out a little bit because it's a lone pair. If it was all sigma bonds, you couldn't do that. So an sp3 carbon, always hard no when it comes to when it comes to resonance. We don't need to worry about this over here when it comes to resonance. The net result here is basically we shifted the negative charge from this oxygen to that oxygen. Just like I was saying with my example with the nitrate earlier. It's not really like one of the oxygens gets a double bond and the other one has a single bond. They both have one and a half bonds in this case. Which means they also, the negative charge is on this entire group, not on one oxygen versus the other oxygen. Both of those oxygens energetically are equivalent. They both have like half of the negative charge. Because really, you have both of these averaged out together. It would be somewhere in between the triplet or somewhere in between the pair of oxygens. The triplet as I mean the two oxygens and the carbon. Would it be somewhere in the middle of that or in between the oxygens? We would typically... Is that too specific? <laughs> no, no, that's a good question because like those electrostatic potentials I was showing earlier, right. um, we would draw it as something like this entire, this side has one negative charge collectively. The, ox the carbon doesn't really have negative, neither of those two resonance structures does the carbon have a negative charge. It's just all the oxygen. Just the oxygens, which but makes sense yeah. because the oxygens are more electronegative, right? So the oxygens are fighting over the negative charge. They'd rather have the negative charge, and carbon is just kind of stuck in the middle. I guess I'm, you know, I mean, it's um, okay. So it's not. Uh, I was picturing it as the electrons flowing mm -hmm. through the carbon, but it's more around. <laughs> they're space. they're flowing through the carbons, but you still have two carbon oxygen bonds, and those electrons are not being shared equally between the carbon and the oxygen. So, and really this whole thing would wind up having a gradient. 
negative charge at this end and a gradient towards a partial positive on this end, but it wouldn't be a full part positive because the overall net molecule has to have a negative charge to it. Can we estimate sp2 carbon have a lone pair of electrons? In an sp2 carbon, we can have an sp3 carbon with a lone pair, a carbon ion would look like the lone pair. That whole thing has a negative charge. I don't know if you could have an sp2 carbon that also had a negative charge. And an sp2 carbon is already pretty electron rich. I'm sure you could do that, but it'd be extremely unstable. Um, if you try to do something similar, like try to do something like that, that's that carbon's got a negative negative charge too. I'm not sure if you would ever see that happening, even in a in a mechanism, really, because because that's going to be so unstable. You know me, I hesitate to use absolutes, so I hedge on that, but that doesn't look familiar to me, and I've taught this class a lot. <laughs> All right, let's take a break, and we come back the, for this problem. I want you to, the arrows are drawn for you. The arrows are drawn for you. Drawing what's on the other side of those res that resonance structure shouldn't be that hard, right? Drawing the arrows is really the tricky part. So when we come back, we'll draw the other version of each of these and get some practice with these. And then I'll have you draw the red arrows yourself. All right, so let's come back at 10 after. Let's see here a little early today. Okay. No. Left at 45 cents. Yeah. No, no worries. 
So let's go ahead and get that. It's not exactly 10 after by that clock, but we're all here and it's about 10 minutes from when I said 10 after, so I figure close enough. So these first two might look, or the first one might look familiar. We can move these electrons towards a positive charge because what is a positive charge when the carbon indicates? Does that carbon have eight electrons? No. You can't get a positive charge on a carbon with four bonds. Um, and so if a carbon has a positive charge, it has a vacancy. It has an empty spot for a pair of electrons. So this is the first one we started with, our first example. We moved a pair of electrons over, but that left a gap on the left-hand side. The middle carbon has eight electrons either way. If we draw the complete structure, looks like this. So we left behind a vacancy on the other carbon because we pulled the pi electrons of one away from the left-hand carbon and gave them to the right-hand carbon. But the middle carbon has four bonds in both cases. So one of the one of the patterns that you'll notice, I don't I don't like to talk about it like the charges are jumping from carbon to carbon because it's really the electrons moving. And if it's a positive charge, it's a gap that's left. But if you think about it in terms of the charges moving, where did the charge go? The, the charges will usually alternate atoms. So on the far right to the far left. A negative charge is gonna look pretty similar, except now we've got extra pair of electrons on the right-hand side, instead of having a vacancy on the right-hand side. So that lone pair can move over, but we've got to make room for it. So now we have a new pi bond here and an extra pair of electrons sitting around on this, on this side. So once again, it still looks like the charge alternated carbons. In this case, it, with negative charges, that's easier to think about it that way because it actually is the electrons moving that direction. How about C? We've got a lone pair turning into a pi bond. Then we need to make room for it. So this carbon didn't change. This carbon still is going to have the same number of bonds. This oxygen has three lone pairs, which gives it what charge? One. Minus one. This oxygen had two lone pairs, now it only has one lone pair. So an oxygen with only one lone pair and three bonds has a positive charge. So we went from something where everything had a formal charge of zero, when we had a formal charge of minus one and a plus one, the net charge on the molecule didn't change though. Out of these two choices, which one would we expect to be the more stable? In general, if we can draw a lowest stop structure with zero formal charges, that's going to be more stable. This one does still affect things a little bit because it does allow us to spread out these pi electrons and lone pair electrons a little bit more and get sort of that smeared out um, orbitals but it's not gonna be as prevalent. Remember how I said before break, just because you have two possible resonance structures doesn't mean they're equal in terms of how important they are when it comes to averaging things. This would be, I'm just gonna put numbers to it. I'm not, these numbers are not accurate. I'm just making them up, but this might be something like 90% of the time, or it looks 90% like this and then 10% like this. And again, it's not 90% of the time, I know I just said it that way, but it's really more like a weighted grade 
where 90% of the grade comes from the neutral one and 10% of the grade comes here. They're not equally valuable in terms of what the, the mixture looks like. So think about that as far as like a mental uh, chlorine, like the, the diagram that you made, um, would it have the same kind of gradient where the more stable would be, I guess, it would shift a little bit towards that other oxygen having some more electron density. Correct, because part, because one of the two resonance structures has a positive charge here, this oxygen, even when we drop, when we consider it mostly, mostly in its neutral state, this oxygen is going to have a slight, slightly, a slight partial positive to it, at least compared to a regular oxygen. And then this oxygen is going to be more negative than a carbon oxygen normally would be because they also have this mixed in. And again, I don't want you thinking about it too much, like it's alternating back and forth between these. But if you think about it in terms of the probability, like if you grabbed it at random and forced the electrons to be in one state or the other, 90% of the time when you grabbed it, it would look like that. And 10% of the time when you grabbed it, it would look like this. And in between, it's both. Right, that's the whole point of Schrodinger's cat as a thought experiment. Until you check, it's both alive and dead. And in Schrodinger's cat, and, and and if it was a 50-50 chance, like let's say it was a coin flip that determined whether the cat was alive or dead, like the benzene ring, if they're equally likely, then you've got a 50-50 shot, shot when you open it to, that it's, the cat's going to be alive versus dead. But if it's like a one in 10 chance that the cat dies, it's still a mixture of those two possible states. But 90% of the time when you open the box, the cat's still alive. And 10%, it's just a little bit like the cat can come back to life if you close the box again. You get unlucky. You get unlucky at first one. Okay. If you did this with 100 cats in 100 boxes. <laughs> 90% of the cats are going to be fine, and 10% of the cats are not. You don't know which cat is which until you open it and check, though. And as a side note, Schrodinger's cat was really actually designed to, it's, it's not a, a bad thought experiment um, in some ways, but it actually was designed to illustrate um, how ridiculous it would be to try to apply quantum mechanics laws and math to it in the everyday macroscopic world. <laughs> so it's supposed to be ridiculous. That's the whole point of that thought experiment. But it also does put it into context and give us something we can visually picture, I even read, as, as weird as it is. I read about someone physically like making a Schrodinger's box where it was Ooh. like a mustard gas type of situation. If you open the box, it's a chance. It sounds like pre-World War II. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Peter's going to stand for that anymore. Um, yeah, they, and they found other ways to demonstrate the same thing without the end of cruelty. Right. They can show how, how the quantum math works without actually killing any cats. I don't so, think they put a cat in Yeah, they, they were just, just like, oh, this is what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, and that's good. Box. <laughs> I like cats. I don't want that. <laughs> All right, so here's... A molecule where you've got a negative charge, you've got a carbon with a negative charge. A pair of electrons is moving over and then making room for it. We have a pi bond turning into a lone pair, moving away from that first carbon. So then we'll have a single bond here, nitrogen with two lone pairs, then a double bond here. Nitrogen with two lone pairs has got a negative charge. It is one bond fewer than neutral. Is there any difference between drawing your pi bond on the inside of that mess or on the outside? Of no. Yeah. Uh, wherever it's convenient. Would we find a difference later down the line in more advanced classes? We're not actually showing the shape of the orbital, so I don't think it matters. 
Okay. Um, you will see, I typically tend, I tend to put my second bond on the inside of a, of a bend like that, but some softwares by default will do, do it like that. Right. And that's fine too, because, because we're not actually trying to show the three-dimensional shape of the bond, so it doesn't really matter. All right, so there's some certain patterns that wind up showing up all over, all over the place when we're doing these. Anytime you get a lone pair that's one bond away from a pi bond, that's going to have a stable resonance structure. Maybe not as stable, but somewhat stable. What would the resonance structure have to look like here? If you have a lone pair next to a pi bond, what could you do? Pair up the oxygen creates a pi bond, pi bond gets taken off, and uh, on the carbon. Does everybody see that? So that it's going to look like, so that first one doesn't change. We had a pi bond, now we have a sigma bond. We have pi bond here instead. We didn't break any sigma bonds. We didn't kick any atoms off. What are the charges going to look like? The charge from that carbon that we added a bonder to. Because now that that carbon did have four bonds, and now it has three bonds in a lone pair. Because we broke the pi bond. There's still a lone pair on the oxygen, right? And there's still one lone pair on the oxygen. Which means the oxygen's charge is going to be what? It's got one extra bond, so it's sharing less than it, or sharing more than it wants to. So plus one. This one kind of makes sense because you had a bond, and now it had, controls all of those electrons on its own. This is just the opposite. It had a lone pair that it owned entirely, and now that lone pair that it owned outright is being shared. So it has one fewer electron owned on the oxygen than it started with. And if you're trying to double check yourself on that, this first one, putting a negative charge here because we broke the pi bond, that made sense, right? We have extra electrons down here now. The overall molecule started out neutral. So if we made a negative charge at the bottom, we have to make a positive charge somewhere else. And it makes sense to put the positive charge where the electrons came from that started this process. And so the uh, this position, one carb or one bond away from a pi bond, is what's known as the allylic position. Specifically, I believe a little it refers to when it's a carbon carbon pi bond. Um, but really, that, that the main thing we're trying to get across here is that one sigma bond away from a pi bond is the allylic position. And if you have a lone pair there, then you can always do something like this. It might look a little bit different depending on what you started with and what the charges were to begin with. But it's going, always going to be something like this where the lone pair moves towards the pi bond and then the pi bond moves away to make a new lone pair. The other way you can check your, your answer on this is you should wind up with the same total number of lone pairs before and afterwards, right? With this, with this um, particular pattern. All we did really did is we moved a lone pair. The net result is we moved a lone pair from the oxygen to the carbon. So did we put oxygen on the end of this molecule instead of that carbon? So Over right here? Uh, on the other end? Yeah, that one says so like dual allylic, right? Yeah. In that original structure. That's another set of lone pairs adjacent to a pi bond, right? So that gives us another resonance structure. That's the other thing about these resonance structures. We're not limited to just two. You can have as many resonance structures as you want that follow these rules here. Only move electrons don't break a signal bond. Net charge doesn't change. 
and the electrons only move one bond away. But you can have a couple arrows at the, in, at the same time. All right, so here's more practice without the arrows. I'll give you a few minutes. You, you draw the arrows and lone pairs and try and come up with a resonance structure for each of these. So sorry, while I'm thinking about it, my office hours on Thursdays um, changed. They were, it was nine o'clock uh, to 10 o'clock. So before class on Thursdays, because academic Senate president stuff, I have meetings. I have meetings actually both before and after class on Thursdays now, um, but the one before class is tighter. Um, so my office hours are going to be immediately after class on Thursdays. So if you have any questions, on Thursdays before the quiz starts, um, I'll still be around noon to one. Um, and we can you can just ask after class or um, take a break, get some food, come down to my office. Um, but it's gonna be 10 or uh, sorry, 12 to one on Thursdays instead of nine, nine to 10. The rest of the week you can find me nine o'clock in my office close to it. All right, let's look at B first. B is a little bit easier. B, we've got one lone pair. It wasn't explicitly drawn, but we have a carbon with a negative charge. Carbon with a negative charge means that one of its bonds is actually a lone pair instead. So if you have a long pair and a pi bond, your arrows look something like that. We have a pi bond there, and our negative charge shifted down. Then let's just see, we're gonna end with A because I wanna get into all those lone pairs and how do we know what to do? C is another, there's two lone pairs. One of those lone pairs is gonna move over, which means you have to make room for it. You give a negative charge here, a pi bond there. Oxygen with three bonds means what? Negative. Three bonds means positive. positive. It lost an electron, which makes it positive. 
There goes Ben Franklin screwing up the charges again, making our life more complicated. And again, for both of these, the net charge didn't change. One of the keys to make sure we did it right. We had a net neutral molecule. Now, even, now we have a molecule with a minus and a plus. So it's not as stable as it would be. But that's still a way we can delocalize one of those lone pairs. All right, let's look at A. We have two atoms with lone pairs. How do we know which lone pairs are going to participate in resonance? What's that? Drier hydrogens. Drier hydrogens? Yeah, your other bonds to your carbons. That's part of the key. That might help. There's one, so we, we know we're not going to be moving electrons towards either of these carbons. That carbon doesn't have any hydrogens because it has four bonds already. But we could, could we move this pair of electrons? And then we would have to move the pi electrons away to make room. Does that work? What does that do to that oxygen? That gives that oxygen 10 electrons. So we can't do that. Would that also give five bonds to the carbon there in the middle, or maybe I was misreading your arrows? Well, I wasn't being very, very careful with how I threw them because it was going to be wrong either way. Right. <laughs> if we draw them this way, then if we just left it like that, then yeah, that would give the carbon five bonds. We can't do that. What do we have to do? Shift up the five bonds. Make room. Yeah. All right. And the other way to think about it is that oxygen has lone pairs in the allylic position. That's not the allylic position because it's part that atom is part of the pi bond. Anything that's already part of the pi bond can't give more electrons towards in that direction because it's already got a p orbital already pointed that way. And so there's no room for it. You're going to move away from the existing pi bond. Could you move a lone pair towards? Oh man, this is gonna be hard to ask. Think about how to phrase it. <laughs> Sometimes that answers the question <laughs> for you. Right. You wanna think, about, think about it? Okay. It. All right, so here's some more examples. If you have an allylic lone pair, Two curved arrows. That's the one we just practiced, right? You have an allylic carbocation. Because a carbocation, a carbon with a positive charge, means an empty space. If it's in the allylic position, there's room to just move that pi bond over. That's the first one we started with, right? If you have a lone pair adjacent to a carbocation, for a similar reason, really, right? Instead of a pi bond moving over into the empty space, if you have a lone pair adjacent to the empty space, you can just move that over. That one, we haven't done an example that looks like that yet. What would the result of this look like? Positive charge on the oxygen. You would have a double bond on the left. Yeah. You would lose that positive charge. Positive charge. We don't lose the positive charge. It's just the oxygen. Yeah. yeah. Which of these is more stable? The one with the positive charge on the carbon. That's usually the first instinct. Why? Because the oxygen is more electromagnetic, so it's more for electronegativity. And I like you thinking in terms of electro electronegativity, but. What was more important than getting all the formal charges low on our list of Lewis dot structure criteria? Mm 
It was use the right number of electrons, then something else, and then get the formal charge as low as possible, right? What was the middle one? Fill the valences. Yeah. Filling valences is more important than getting the formal charges to zero. So four now bonds to carbon. This one, this one, everything has a full valence, even though we still have the positive charge on the oxygen. The oxygen still has a full valence though. It's just not as stable. That particular atom is not as stable as it could be, but we at least have everything with the full valence. So this is the more important resonance, the more stable resonance structure. When I say the more important resonance structure, more stable resonance structure, those mean the same thing, right? They're gonna be the larger weight in our weighted average between the two. So whatever you can point to is more stable, that's the more significant resonance structure, more important resonance structure. And it goes in the same level of importance as our Lewis dot structures. Make sure you didn't lose electrons somewhere. You still have the right number of electrons. Then make sure all the valences are filled and then we start looking at formal charges. And as a corollary to then we start looking at formal charges, ideally formal charges closest to zero. But if you're going to have charges, putting a positive on a less electronegative element and a negative on a more electronegative element is better. Here's one that kind of does the opposite of what we were just talking about. If you have a pi bond between two atoms of differing electronegativity, we can just break that bond and give the extra the extra lone pair to the oxygen to make something that looks like this. But is that as stable as that? Not only did we add charges, we, we broke up a full valence to do it. So this is possible. This is way more common. This is maybe this is a one to 99 ratio, but probably more like one, one to a thousand. Because breaking up a full valence is so energetically unfavorable. Then the last one, if you have conjugated pi bonds, especially if they're enclosed in a ring, but anytime you have conjugated pi bonds, by which I mean pi bond, they alternate double bond, single bond, double bond. That's what I mean by conjugated. So in that molecule that I used for the electrocyclic reaction earlier, called 1,3-butadiene, those are conjugated pi bonds. Anytime you have conjugated pi bonds, you can draw a resonance structure. Just like it's it's just like having a lone pair in the allylic position. It's a pi bond in the allylic position. You have a pi bond in the allylic position. What could we do? What would it look like? Either way, yeah, which however you feel, <laughs> and then we need to make room for it, yeah, right? All of our atoms are still in the same places. All our nuclei are still in the same places. So added a pi bond there. What are the charges going to look like? We moved electrons. We started with the pi bond here, and then we gave the electric carbon on the right full custody, if you will, of those electrons. And we emptied. There's probably some good analogies related to blended families in here too. You want to think about the, the pi electrons as being shared custody and lone pairs as being um, as being sole custody. This carbon got it got his his little electron children taken away from him. They are now in a relationship. They're shared custody of those two kids. This carbon now has full custody of the ones that were shared custody. 
go even broader with that and say that they're, they're sharing um, residence. Yeah, so co co parenting is a resonance structure yeah. for sure. <laughs> so if you were to draw like um, those like dotted lines and just like draw a dotted line across the whole object, you could. We typically use the dotted lines when we have two equally stable resonance structures because the dotted lines are kind of implying that there is a good wall chance. But here, yeah, this one. we added formal charges and we broke up a full valence. It's a possibility we see this happen with some reactions that they must go through a state that looks kind of like this. But this is far more common. You know, probably our, our 999 times out of a thousand, it looks like this. And maybe one out of every thousand, it looks like this. It's not statistically insignificant, but it's pretty small. Would this resonance structure, say one out of 99,000, is along with this, would that be a benzene ring? Just like the if you put the two of them together, we don't have enough pi electrons to make, so we would need more pi electrons because we have to make new sigma bonds too. But yes, if you, you will get that same reaction that we talked about earlier, um, will happen if you have two of these molecules right next to each other, they will some portion of the time react together to make something that looks like a six-sided ring. So something like that. Oh, interesting, okay. If you take, you take two of these and Take this section and attach it here and here. Then you get an extra two carbons hanging off the side. So you get something look like that. Yeah, we do wind up with a lot of weird things happening with resonance because these things are pretty reactive in a lot of ways, especially if we can make more sigma bonds. Because resonance structures are great. They help make things, pi systems, more stable. Sigma bonds are always more stable than pi bonds with the exception of aromaticity. When we actually get to defining aromatic um, is when you have the odd number of pi electrons in a cycle structure. That's what gives benzene its super stable character. You have to have both the odd number of odd number of electron pairs, not odd number of electrons, odd number of electron pairs and have them in a circle and that collectively makes the whole thing more stable. We don't get all of that here because we don't have an, enough pi electrons. All right. This is this, so there was some more practice here. Um, if we have time, we will go back to it. But I wanted to actually put this. I know I said these things out loud, but there is a list of criteria, and this is from most important to the least important. So what's most important is have, having everything with a full octet as much as possible. And this means as far as stability, which ones? If you stable? have, yeah, if you're comparing resonance structures, the one that has more filled octets is more stable. Therefore, it's more, what we use the term, the more significant resonance structure. Formal charge is closest to zero. If you have the same number of formal charges bet between two, but you can put your negative charge on a more electronegative atom versus a less electronegative atom, putting a negative charge on a more electronegative atom would be more stable and positive charge on a less electronegative atom, the corollary there um, that I didn't explicitly write out. And if all three of these are equal, then your resonance structures are going to be more or less equally significant. And which we, we would call that contributing equally. That's our 50-50 mixture. And this can apply to more than two as well. Like it's always easiest to say, to compare one to one, but if you have three possible resonance structures, 
You can have two that contribute equally and then one that's, that's a lot less than the other two. Or one that's more stable and then two that are equally improbable. Like for instance, our butadiene example. Here we, we can draw two different resonance structures, one that puts the positive charge on the left and one that puts the positive charge on the right. These two are functionally identical, not functionally, they are identical as far as stability goes, right? Neither of them is as good as this one. So out of three possibilities, this is our what we call the major contributor the most significant resonance structure, the one in the middle. And then these other two resonance structures are contributors, but not as much. They're less significant or less probable. I'm trying to use lots of different value words because they, they get used uh, in a lot of places. They all kind of mean the same thing. Most important to least important. Most stable, less stable. Most significant, less significant. Major contributor, minor contributors. So, and then the, there's some slides that just have some practice or some examples. So, comparing these two, minor contributor because we have an incomplete valence. That puts a positive charge on the oxygen, but everything has a full valence now. So major contributor, the most significant, is the one on the right. In this case, we could have something like this. We wind up putting a positive charge on the carbon and negative charge on the oxygen, but we broke up the valence to do that. That's the minor contributor breaking up. And then if there's another one, you can see moving another pair of electrons. So that we actually had an incomplete octet on the oxygen to give it a positive charge. If that's not an oxygen with a with an extra bond, that's an oxygen missing a lone pair. That's even worse. An oxygen with an incomplete valence is even more unstable than a carbon with an incomplete valence. So in that case, if there's something, I'm not going to be that picky. If you wanted to rank all three of these and say major, middle. Minor, I would say that to this, you can draw this by following all of our rules though. So I'm not gonna mark this as a, as a incorrect. So that's like structure as being insignificant. As long as you label it being insignificant or at least least significant out of these. All right. Um, formal charges closest to zero. The one last thing that I want to say that shows up on the quiz so that I, so I want to make sure I, I define it is this delocalized term. Right? Delocalized just means that if you have a lone pair or a charge that can be spread out by using resonance. So anytime you've got a lone pair, a lilic to a pi bond, that's a going to be a delocalized lone pair. Anytime you've got a charge, that you can spread between two places by having a, by having resonance structure. That's a delocalized charge. The charge is not stuck in one place. Right. So when it goes, one of the quiz questions this week is how many of the lone pairs on this molecule are delocalized? Count your lone pairs and then see which lone pairs could be part of resonance structure. And right. so the last thing is only one of these lone pairs would we consider to be delocalized. You can't have all three of these lone pairs participating in the resonance. You can't around unless it's going to throw it, off the charge. Exactly, because we resonance ba is based on having these unhybridized p orbitals, right? You can't have more than one unhybridized p orbital that is still lined up with the pi bonds. Because remember that all these p orbitals are x, y, and z. They're all 90 degrees from each other, right? So you're only ever going to have one of these three can be delocalized. 
And neither of these two can be, could be delocalized because this auction already has a five bond for me. All right, we'll end there, then it's too early. Um, and we will continue to practice with this and we'll start applying this and learning how to name these structures and draw constitutional isomers on Tuesday. Okay. Hey, have a good weekend, everybody.